Nous avons quelques mots euh, de monsieur, le, le doyen de notre faculté des sciences sociales, monsieur Marcel Merit. I welcome a few words. We'll hear a few words from our, the dean of the faculty of social sciences, uh, professor Marcel Merit. Oui, bonjour, good morning, uh, everybody. Uh, with such uh, um, great, inspiring opening ceremony, I'm going to be brief. Actually, I have, I have prepared a speech, you can see it here, but it's so bad compared with what we have just uh, listening. So that time, I'm going to say just a few words to you. Alors, uh, le premier, c'est bien sûr, vous souhaitez la plus chaleureuse et bienvenue uh, ici à Ottawa, à l'Université d'Ottawa. Uh, bienvenue aux collègues, bienvenue aux étudiants, aux étudiants, bienvenue à tous ceux, bien sûr, qui ont dû parcourir une bonne distance pour se rendre ici. Ça fait vraiment plaisir de vous voir ici. Um, the second thing I want to say is that uh, anthropological studies is something which is very much expanding, growing at the University of Ottawa. Uh, we had uh, founded the, the Department of Sociology 55 years ago. We have introduced anthropological studies programs uh, about 10 years ago. And now we have a school, a school of uh, sociological anthropological studies. And we have a bachelor degree, we have a master degree. And in the pipeline, we have a PhD degree coming up. Um, troisième chose que j'aimerais vous dire, c'est que j'ai vu le programme, uh, les thématiques, etc. C'est vraiment excitant. Alors, uh, bien sûr, uh, je pense que ça risque d'être très, 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 très productif. C'est toute une, une organisation de faire une grosse conférence comme ça. Alors, j'en profite pour féliciter, bien sûr, tous ceux qui l'ont organisé. And finally, I, I wish you a um, very fruitful, uh, productive discussion. And I would say also friendly and uh, hopefully an opportunity given the opening here uh, to develop French, friendships among all of us. And also, uh, I also love you all. So have a good conference. Thank you very much. And now a few words from uh, the director, interim director of our school, uh, Mr. Nathan Young. Alors, uh, Nathan Young de notre école. Merci beaucoup. Um, au nom de um, l'école des études sociologique um, et anthropologique de l'Université d'Ottawa. Je vous souhaite um, un accueil très chaleureux. Um, I'm very glad to see everybody here. Um, as was mentioned, we've had uh, tremendous growth um, um, on the anthropology side um, of our department, uh, which is now a school. Uh, and it's very exciting to see that everybody is here to share these new experiences um, with us um, as we continue to grow. Uh, I also just want to say um, a very deep thank you uh, to all of the organizers. Uh, quite a few members of our unit were very deeply involved in organizing this activity. Uh, and also I would like to put a special shout out uh, to all of the student volunteers. So when you see somebody, oh, and he's just left, when you see somebody in a bright orange t-shirt, uh, you need to say thank you to them because they are volunteering to make sure that this is a wonderful event um, um, and a wonderful conference. And we have literally dozens of our students who are very deeply involved in this activity. So, so thank you very much. Um, I'm very happy to welcome you uh, to Ottawa um, and to um, I'm at the university here, um, and if you get a chance to come and visit us um, on the 10th floor um, of the Social Sciences Building, we'd be happy to say hi in person as well. So thank you very much. Thank you. And now, since you might know, there's a complicated composition of names for a conference, so we have a few words from the president of Kalska, afterwards uh, from the president of the IUAAS, Junji Koizumi, Here I present you Donna Patrick, and uh, then we're going to have our keynote. It's literally just a few words. I just want on behalf of the Canadian Anthropology Society to welcome everybody here to this joint CASCA IUAS conference, the first time we've ever done this. Um, I really want to thank everybody for traveling far, from afar to make this a really interesting international event and to join, into converse, join in conversations and to listen and to participate in 
all sorts of interesting interactions. And welcome to Ottawa as well. And enjoy the conference. Thank you very much. And also thank you to everyone who's helped put this together. Thanks. Thank you. I find it interesting. You can see we're accelerating the pace. Uh, is, uh, <laughs> but slow is, was soothing too. Um, Mr. Jonggi Koizumi? From the IOA, yes. Um, I'm Jinj Koizumi, Secretary General of the IOA, yes. Um, President Fay Harrison was supposed to uh, make a speech uh, at this opening, but unfortunately, due to a series of many uh, canceled flights and uh, uh, delayed flights. Uh, she could not arrive here this morning. Uh, so she asked me to read her speech uh, on her behalf. Uh, it's rather long. Colleagues and friends, it is with a great deal of enthusiasm that the IUS Executive Committee extends its heartfelt greetings to the leaders and the elders of the Algonquin and Nishinaabe nation uh, on whose unceded ancestral lands we are gathered for this joint annual meeting of Kiaska and the 2017 Inter-Congress of the IUAS. The IUAS also expresses its deepest appreciation to the city of Ottawa, the University of Ottawa, uh, the able leadership of the Canadian Anthropology Society, CASCA, President Donna Patrick, and President Mike, uh, Michel uh, Bouchard, and especially to the conference convener, Scott Simon. We also thank the advisory, scientific, and local committees whose conscientious efforts have made it possible for us all to be here today. It has been a genuine labor of love working with Casca and witnessing its dedication to anthropology in Canada and to anthropologies throughout the world. In getting us all here today, Casca's commitment has been matched by the administrative diligence of Nomad IT, the administrative team of the event organizers and IT specialists who play such a central role in managing professional organizations such as ours and its organizing meetings uh, that promote our intellectual vitality and collegiality. It is important that we not make these connect concerted and coordinated efforts for granted especially at this most challenging time when academic freedom, freedom of expression, the right to education, the right to free assembly along with many other rights, freedoms and capacities are under serious jeopardy in many parts of the world. In fact, we don't really have to look that far afield to find troubled conditions that affect anthropologists' ability to do research, teach, and travel. We have colleagues who face the threat of being denied visas, the threat of having funding and other kinds of official support for, for their departments and the academic institutions eliminated and the threat of being arrested and imprisoned, as was the case of Concordia University's Professor Homer Hudfor, who is back home now and participate, a participant of this uh, conference. On Saturday morning, we'll have a chance to converse with Hudfor, uh, with her in a, in a forum on feedback and risk in uh, fieldwork and risk in a vibrant world. 
the various assaults against the anthropologists and the world's people, along with the responses to them, are shaped by historically contingent complexities and movements move on. Anthropologists have the motivation and many of the tools to interrogate and interpret these uh, befuddling phenomena. And what tools we lack? We can occur through particip- uh, part- partnership, excuse me, through partnerships with other scientists and other scholars. Greater organizational support for such partnerships are already at the top of the agenda of the International Council for Science, ICSU, and the International Social Science Council, ISSC. Last October, the members of these two countries uh, voted in support of an in-principle agreement to merge. A potential merger would enable the sciences, including the social sciences, to respond more effectively to global challenges through transdisciplinary, transdisciplinary strategies of scientific corporations. We are fortunate to have ICSU President Gordon McBean here to deliver a special lecture on this topic this evening. By translating the results of our most, uh, most policy-relevant research and social analysis into practical applications, we can help work toward resolving some of the urgent problems the world faces, be they related to immigration, Islamophobia, gender and racialized violence, health, uh, health crisis, food security, sustainable environments, eliminate, uh, climate change, or war, conflict resolution, and peace. To ensure our capacity to realize our full potential as intellectuals and as advocates for democratic and decolonizing forms of knowledge production, that can make meaningful difference in the world. Anthropologists need to speak to each other and to the world from shared platform of action that facilitates our ability to cultivate the unification of our diverse voices. The IUAS and WCAA have come to envision that shared platform of the World Anthropological Union, WOW, the bicameral organization that will emerge from the merger of anthropologies to global organizations, both of which will continue to operate as distinct but interrelated chambers within a a larger union. In September 2016 ballot, the members of the two organizations supported the world's establishment and gave the IUAS and WCAA executives a mandate to move forward in this historic direction. You now have an opportunity to participate in this movement toward WOW by casting your vote on the gradual incremental procedure for the review, revision, and eventual ratification of the operational guidelines and rules, OGRs, along with the WOW constitution. The draft constitution was circulated at the time of the September 2016 vote, so it is not now new for you. The votes you cast will be counted at the IUS General Assembly on Friday evening. Please attend. If you are unable to attend, you can still cast your vote anytime before the General Assembly by depositing it in the ballot boxes available at the registration desk and elsewhere. If the proposed procedure is approved, we encourage some of you to volunteer to serve on the review committee that will take the operational guidelines, the rules, and the constitution toward their eventual approval. Please work with us in this movement toward a more unified global community of anthropologists. Enjoy the conference, and thank you all for being here. We hope you go back home with something valuable after this conference. Thank you very much.
Uh, bonjour. Hello. I'm going to be very quick. I want to thank everybody for making this possible. Uh, we made this the greatest opening ceremony ever. Kichi miigwech. Um, and I want to welcome everybody <laughs> from all over the world to come to this unceded territory of the Algonquin Nation. Maimi Wiwini Anishinaabe Agi. I think that this year the federal government is encouraging us to celebrate the 150th anniversary of Canada. I think we've all learned today that this land has a much more ancient tradition, a very powerful culture and people, and we must be thankful of that. We are honored that they reach out their hands and welcome us to also become Anishinaabe people, real people. And I think that the world with all the xenophobia and everything going on and with an uh, ecological disaster, I think the world needs a lot more Anishinaabe wisdom. So I hope everybody can take some lessons home. So that's all I'm going to say. Welcome. I love you all. <laughs> and chi miigwech for everybody for being here. Merci beaucoup. Si vous avez besoin des écouteurs pour l'interprétation simultanée pendant la, la conférence plénière, la, uh, les écouteurs sont à la porte. If you need the, uh, the uh, headsets for French translation, Rowan's walking around and giving them out. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, there were some volunteers who wanted to come up, but they're not there, and we don't have any more time. And I'm very happy now to introduce you to our keynote speaker. Alors, je, ça me fait plaisir de vous introduire à notre uh, conférencière plénière, Leslie Green, qui est professeure à l'Université de, de Cape Town, en, en Afrique du Sud. Et uh, je pense que ce, sa présentation uh, va, va être en être en continuité euh, pour amener toutes les autres formes de vie qui vont euh, faire partie de la conférence pendant toute la semaine. So Leslie, I'd like to invite you here. Leslie works in politics of knowledge at the University of, well, she has, she does a lot of things around ecologies. I'll let her, she has a very well prepared and fantastic speech that will speak for itself, but uh, she's a professor at the University of Cape Town in South Africa. And uh, she works uh, on many issues with relation to the environment, uh, from baboons to uh, petrol, and from all sorts of forms of life that she will speak to you about. So thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs> right. Hello. How are you? It's been a wonderful session, thank you. It reminds me of uh, being in Rio de Janeiro a couple of years ago with a session organized by Eduardo Viveros de Castro. And in one of the talks, he had invited a leading First Nations indigenous speaker, Ailton Krenak. And the title of Ailton Krenak's speech was Dance to Keep the Sky from Falling. And I think you've reminded us of that. Um, my question to, to, um, to Ailton was, I come from a profession, from a world where we sit to keep the sky from falling. We sit at our desks, we sit in our conferences, we sit in our cars, we sit in our airplanes. Um, what do we do? And he said, you have to learn to sing. So thank you for bringing us to a space. And I wondered, you know, you, you have been sitting for a long time. I wonder if you would like to just... Um, Stand where you are and touch the sky. Don't feel like you have to if you need to. But <laughs> sometimes bodies just need to stretch a little. Um, so feel free. But thank you very much for the invitation. Okay. Right. Great. I see real bodies. <laughs> um, terrific. So thank you very much for the invitation to from the IUAS, from CASCA, from my colleagues here at the University of Ottawa, and Muggsy Spiegel from Cape Town, who's the IUAS treasurer. Now, 
I was asked to, to speak about this idea of moving knowledge. And I thought I would begin with uh, one of Aesop's fables, which is the story of a deer that is blind in one eye. With the particular head that she has, our deer is in trouble, for she lives at the edge of a forest, and she cannot see in both sides, and she's truly afraid that a predator is going to come at her from the side that she cannot see. So, thinking about this, she decides to live on the beach where the forest meets the sea and keep her good eye on the forest where the predators were going to come from and her bad eye on the sea where lived only the fish and the birds. She lived happily, but not forever after. For some fishers came one day, passed in a boat, and they pulled up and feasted on her for days. Aesop's deer is useful for us, I think, in modern universities, modernist universities, because, like us, she reduced her world to two sides and focused her expertise accordingly. So, who might this deer be for us? Perhaps she's the conservationist who wants to protect ecosystems but not think about people, to think about extinctions but not about expulsions. Perhaps she is the ecologist working on ecosystem services who does not talk to the philosophers who question financialization. Perhaps she is the food security expert who attends to productivity but does not think of the damage that fertilizer is doing to the soil. Perhaps she is the politics graduate who has no knowledge of climate diplomacy. Maybe she is the law student who will one day be a judge who has not studied the jurisprudence that is needed for a time of extinctions. Perhaps the deer is a journalist who, in an unprecedented drought where gunfights erupt over water, ignores the implications of radical ecological change and insists that the state must only secure property rights. Perhaps she's the academic who only ever present, presents work at conferences that she's familiar with. Perhaps she's the teacher who only ever signs white scholarship. Whatever the reading we make of Aesop's deer, the story helps us to think of the problems with the university system that has inherited the separation of its disciplines into nature and science on the one side and society and social science on the other. The deer imagines that the one eye she's inherited through the university system is the sole truth that she and her students need. But as the saying goes, and this was taught to me by a journalist in South Africa who had covered a war in the province of KwaZulu-Natal for several years, taught me to see what I was not seeing. And his phrase was, what you see blocks your sight. And I thought it would be quite fun to, to, Google, to, you know, to Google image that phrase. And that's what came up. <laughs> so, <laughs> what you see blocks your sight. When our deer confuses her one and only line of sight with the nature of the world itself, that is when she also loses sight in her third eye, which is her capacity to imagine, which in turn would have kept her moving because she could have imagined other possibilities. So, there are many different kinds of movement. Move, simple movement would have kept our deer alive. Um, and in what, what follows, I want to propose that attending to movement across disciplines in different kinds of ways is one of the most important tools for connecting across the blind spots that we have inherited in our university system, whether we are thinking of perspectives or ontologies or north-south dialogues. And the issue is this, that universities have got more knowledge to offer states and publics and corporates than ever before. But somehow it seems that we have ever less expertise on the arts of integrating across the sciences and the social sciences and the different modes of truth making that go with them. Transdisciplinary work is notoriously difficult and there's very little expertise that we've built as universities on how to think together. It is often easier to simply accept, as we often do in the social sciences, the role of being collectors of social data to answer questions posed in other disciplines, like in the natural sciences. It's a lot harder to be partners in framing of the questions themselves. And the cost to the university of not seeing from both sides, from, from both eyes, the cost to the university system is very, very high. In the absence of a scholarly 
expert framing of the bigger picture, publics tend to see as ever more irrelevant the in-depth work that we do on the issues that we care so deeply about. Knowing more and more about less and less is how one wag described us. And our lack of expertise in integrating the big picture in universities matters ever more at this moment in history because the carbon-based fossil fuel economy actively asserts its own integrated big picture. A neoliberal view of the contemporary world subjects society, ecology, universities, health, etc., etc., to its financialized theorization of the economy. And as it does so, it populates political decision-making with its own theory of what is reasonable and rational. To borrow from Bruno Latour's description, they are the divinities of reason in the knowledge economy. And he names them as technical efficiency, economic profitability, and scientific objectivity. And with these gods of reason, these divinities of reason, neoliberalism appropriates for itself the scientific claim to universalism, making financialized enumeration the new universal truth. It's a little bit like that game that my children play, rock, paper, scissors. And like rock, paper, scissors, the divinities, technical efficiency, economic profitability, scientific objectivity, present a closed loop of options um, that is able to present itself as the producer of unassailable evidence over and over again in courts of law, parliaments, city councils, climate negotiations, and university committee meetings alike. So the question then is, how might we, who are gathered here under the banner of social science and anthropology, contest that which rules in our name through graduate training and the professional networks that provide the experts who are rational? For the problem of this form of expertise is that by controlling the nature of what is considered rational evidence, it seals itself off from empirical disproval. No, for example, in fracking, Courts of law, you may not bring that particular sample of water that predates fracking because it's in a peanut butter jar, and you cannot convince me that, as a court, that that peanut jar was not contaminated, and so on. So over and over and over again, forms of, of evidence get thrown out. It's a system of, of truth-making that's sealed off from empirical disproval. And so the question arises, what forms of empiricism can we use? Are there any that we can use? Arundhati Roy describes the effects of neoliberalism as the end of imagination. Isabel Stenger's <laughs> philosopher of science uses the phrase capitalist sorcery in an extremely finely argued text. And John and Jean Komaroff write of the occult economies of our time. But what is it to occult? And why would I suggest that that's related to movement? So, in astronomy, the term occult to occult has no otherworldliness attached to it. Occultation describes a situation where one object is in front of the other, and you cannot see what is behind it, as in this image where the moon is about to occult Jupiter. The only way to escape the occultation is to move from the point that you are viewing from, or if you cannot move, to draw attention to the alignments that create that occultation, and to hold in mind, when you cannot see Jupiter, that Jupiter has not disappeared. Not being under the spell of the sorcerer who occults one, makes one capable of claiming and holding to the truths that the occultation would have you forget. For us, scholars in the critical humanities and social sciences, it is through cultivating the imagination alongside the empirical arts that we will be able to undo the sorcery that neoliberalism has worked. So, therefore, by empirical arts, I do not mean only the conventional forms of realism known by rational man, rational man with a capital R and a capital M, the patriarch who is our inheritance from modernity, and who, like Cecil John Rhodes, who's been such a focus of decolonial um, activism in South Africa, where I'm from. Cecil John Rhodes, this is a cartoon from Punch, strode across continents from Cape to Cairo with a transcendent certainty in his scientific reasonableness and his colonial superiority. Rhodes was quoted once, Rhodes, Rhodes wrote once, that, uh, quote, I believe we are the finest race in all the earth, and the more of us they are to inhabit it, the better for it. I'm not talking about the kinds of empiricism that he would, he would have held to. Instead, I'm wanting to think with you about the empirical arts offered by feminists and by post-colonial thinkers 
who have learned to hold in mind what is not self-evident. One of those was Aimé Césaire, one of the founders of post-colonialism and a high school teacher of Frantz Fanon. For Césaire, surrealist poetry was a means of speaking to his experience as a colonial subject in a tongue, French, that though he shared its words, had no space for his experience. Through surrealist arts of language, Césaire cultivated his third eye, that eye of the imagination, to unmake the occultation that colonialism had exercised over him. Surrealism offered Césaire a means to speak of the experience of being a slave descendant in the Caribbean, a world that was not visible in the conventional realisms of his time. In Notes on, of a Return to My Native Land, a famous epic poem, he, he said to the ethnologists and the social scientists of his time, a screaming man is not a dancing bear. Surrealism enabled him to show what the fascists were doing in Europe in the 1930s and 1940s was what Europe had long done to Africa, where millions had died in forced labor and in the belly of slave ships. His poetry unsettled words and worlds alike. Reading Césaire now with students in the long shadows of a neoliberal free market ideology that has created political, economic, and ecological crisis is to find a way around the occultations of our time. And so the first form of movement that I'm proposing to be essential to critical scholarship now is the movement of the imagination. In order to be able to tune ourselves to the observational arts of seeing, sensing, valuing, and knowing that which proponents of the rational do not wish researchers to make evident. And yet, the challenge is that the particular form of scientific objectivity that we live with demands that we ought not to see and we ought not to imagine. Scientific objectivity, in its most fundamentalist form, imagines that it provides a universal view without any partiality. But not all traditions of knowledge, however, are so certain that humans can see the whole. Some are a little bit more circumspect. An example, um, in the years 2000 to 2003, I was fortunate to be able to do extensive fieldwork um, in an Arawakan village where, where the language of Palikur is spoken, a language that's spoken by about 3,000 people on the borders of Brazil and French Guiana. And there's a phrase about knowledge in the Palikur language that matters a great deal. It's said a lot in everyday life, and it is just simply two words, hiak haukri. If you think in English, the phrase is a pun because hiak means to know and haukri can mean both world and day. So the pun in English could mean knowing the day or knowing the world. But spoken in Palikura, it's not a pun at all because in everyday astronomy, it is to know the day, or to, sorry, to know the day is to know where you are in the course of our annual journey through the sky which is to know the stars that you cannot see because they are in the day daylight sky. These are the stars that after two months of in invisibility rise again into the dawn sky and then into the sunlit sky. The seasonal rains and the dry times that accompany those particular constellations are named after them. Um, what you see is two carvings of the constellations. The one is Tovar, which is this, this uh, kingfish over here, which uh, equates to the a constellation we know as Aquila the eagle. And in the top right there is the constellation of Kayeb, which appears round about the, the uh, December solstice um, and is associated with the stars that move towards the, the Southern Cross, from Scorpius into the Southern Cross. And that marks the beginning of the rainy season and the, and the solstice. So to know the presence of the invisible is to know the movements in your cosmos and to know to where you have moved, what season it is, and therefore what to do next. To not hiyak haukri, on the other hand, is to be a fool. In other words, having knowledge of the world is to know the ongoing movement that makes some things evident and others invisible. And this Amerindian intellectual heritage, I've argued elsewhere, is a perspectivism not only of partial forms of knowledge known by different bodies, like a person, a jaguar, or an anteater, as Eduardo Viveros de Castro and Tanya Lima have shown so well, but also it's a perspective of the shifting invisibilities of the cosmos. In other words, perspectivism is not just a matter of, of animal views, but it's a whole way of looking at the cosmos and the world. How do we reattune our scholarship 
to the cosmos that is neoliberalism, or to use Isabel Stenker's word, the cosmopolitics of our time. In its simplest form, to take ourselves from out of under the spell of neoliberal forms of knowledge with its illusion of universality and certainty, requires us to move our scholarly gaze to the fields that we have avoided. And the dear example speaks to the limitations of a modernist ontology that produces knowledge in static binaries. In a social science that takes seriously the double urgency of neoliberal forms of reason and climate emergency, which feed one another, we need to be engaging scholars in different fields, however much work it takes to find our conversation with physicists, with chemists, with botanists, with with earth scientists. The Hyak Hakri example speaks of attending to the partial knowledges of a permanently moving world so that what you see, so, sorry, so that, so that you see what you do not know and that you know what you cannot see. But this is not built into modernist knowledge practices that presume a wholly different possibility that a subject can attain transcendent knowledge of objects. Now, philosopher of science, Michel Serre, might be familiar to many of you. And his life work has been with a struggle to, do, to, to, to take on the certainties of modernist knowledge. As his work it draws our attention to a second form of movement, and that is flow. Okay, yeah, yeah. So, in a book called The Birth of Physics, Michel Serre poses a, a critical question. What would modern knowledge have become if movement had been central to the philosophy of the ancient Mediterranean? Greek thought and aesthetics took form around perfect geometrical forms, the circle, the sphere, the triangle, the pyramid, the square, and the cube. Building on that geometry, the knowledge of the plane and the ellipse enabled astronomers to predict occultations and eclipses, notes Serre. But, he adds, all the astronomers in the world cannot predict whether a cloud will block your view of that eclipse. To give René Descartes his, view, his due, I think it was with this worry in mind that his famous method was in fact to give it its full title, Discourse on Method, Optics, Geometry and Meteorology. I think he was, he was beginning to start to think about flow. But, and indeed the fourth book of Discourse um, attends to vapors and their unpredictable, unpredictable movements. But it was the revival of Euclidean geometry in Europe at the time that was ascendant. Um, Michel Serre's two books, Geometry and, and The Birth of Physics, explore why and how modernist science came to focus on stasis and law, rather than on the permanent condition of the world as deriving from flow, percolation, turbulence, vortices, and chaos. Now, Michel Serre was by no means alone in asking this question that what would modernist knowledge have been if we had begun, gone down the tra trajectory of movement instead of stasis. Edmund Husserl's book, The Crisis of European Sciences and Transcendental Phenomenology, was published, was, was, it had, had its earliest manuscript dated in 1936. It has a, an extraordinary appendix titled The Origin of Geometry which observes the universality of geometry but questions the way in which the, the geometrical imagination with its attention to forms and laws produced a, a way of, 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 not, of produced a, a, a knowledge that focuses on law and certainty. Building on that, Jacques Derrida's very first published book was in 1962 was titled Edmund Husserl's Origin of Geometry, an introduction in which Derrida translates um, the, the, that appendix and articulates his first efforts to find a way out of the trap of the objectivity of language. So, all of these scholars in phenomenology, Husserl, Derrida, Serre, are grappling with why is it that stasis has come to be the, the main focus of, 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 of scholarship in modernity. And in this book, um, by Serre, he asks why, if stasis is the exception and the norm of the world is movement, does our world and our body become known to us in, in terms of Euclidean forms? Even when you teach a child to draw, you're teaching them to draw, draw in circle, triangle, rectangle, and so on. And so in this extraordinary book, which has just this year come out in English, traces in the history of philosophy rapture after rapture in which movement has been dissented in favor of the certainties and laws, scientific laws that are possible with the imagination of rest. So it's interesting to me to, to work with that history of science um, and to think about that in the decolonial moment where 
as Sir points out, it's, it's the, 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 the illusory framing of scientific certainty as law itself that has caused such difficulty in, in the rolling out of, of scientific ways of, of knowing in, in, through the, in the colonial project. Um, geometry in the Greek manner, he writes, signifies law, truth, morality, measure, and proportion. Law precedes science and engenders it. And we still have trouble showing philosophers, he says, that our senses are immersed in entirely different spaces, topologies, chaos, fractality. And over the course of the 20th century, we have detached ourselves little by little from the space of the earth as we've taken this objective, geometrical, legal approach to the earth. I put it to my students in this way when I teach this material. When we die, our bones will be in the earth, but we don't have to wait till we die to be in the earth. We're in it already. So perhaps we should not be talking about the environment, but, the, but an environment. For Michel Serre, whose life work has circled around the geometrical imaginaries of space and their consequence, it is the production of an idea of space from which we are separate that has enabled us to conceive of a politics that is a human's only affair on territory rather than in the earth. So as he pointed out in this book, The Natural Contract, which presently was published 27 years ago in 1990, Politics that is based only on a social contract in which humans are able to think about space and not in it is no longer viable. What we need, he says, is a way of organizing our political life so that the Earth's flows that make life possible are also present in our political systems. But those flows remain invisible to us as long as the certainties of geometric laws continue to be the standard for knowledge production in spheres where they should not apply. I find it interesting to, to I found it interesting in the recent months to begin to read two extraordinary books by a scholar based in New York called Brooke Zaporin, who has been thinking with um, the this Chinese concept, the Han Dynasty concept of Li, uh, a concept that's been much contested and much translated. And his his account of its translation, and in, in these two books, he makes an account uh, makes a case for translating Li in a particular way that has to do with coherence, flow, and movement, and its relation to solving everyday problems. So, how could we be thinking if we were thinking instead of in, in forms, but in flows? And perhaps an example is useful. Some of you might have seen the reporting of the 2016 Rolex Innovation Prize, which was awarded to Sonam Wangchuk, an engineer working in the Indian Himalayas who some years back was concerned with the problem that as the glaciers have retreated, villagers living on lower slopes have struggled with longer and longer walks to get water in the summer season, and crops have gone dry. So he was thinking about this, he's an engineer and an innovator of note, and he noticed as he was driving one day an icicle in the summer dangling in the shadow of the bridge, and the idea came to him. His solution was this, in winter, water from a higher stream could be piped downhill to the villages, where gravity creates enough water pressure so that when the end of the point is angled up into the sky, it's, it's, the water shoots out in a fine spray. The air is cold enough to make those little water droplets freeze, and they fall together in a conical shape. Now, a conical shape is a great shape because it's got a minimal surface area. And critically, the, edge, the, the surface of that conical shape creates the shade that the ice inside needs to stay frozen. Um, the ice melts slowly enough in this way to last for months after winter, releasing roughly 5,000 liters of water per day from its 10 million liter capacity at 40 feet high. Wang Chuck describes it as a self-acting solution. Perhaps others might want to describe it as biomimicry or genius, but perhaps we can think of this as Li too, this uh, idea of working with things and their coherences in a specific situation. This solution coheres gravity, spray, temperature, ice droplets, falling, spring, melt. So the inherent tendencies of that situation are held together in a way that each element does what it would normally do. It is a harmony of propensities, to, to borrow the word from Francois Julien, who's written so much about propensity in, in Han thought. Um, for the solution comes from the properties of the situation itself, the movements and the percolations that interest Michel Serre. 
I'm really fascinated by Sonam Wangchuk and his comments about universities. He said this, he said, the world needs real world universities. He calls them doer universities. And he's busy setting up just such an alternative university called the Himalayan Institute for Alternatives. The objective, he says, is to create a sustainable ecosystem of constant innovation, wherein youth from different Himalayan countries will come together to research the issues faced by mountain people and formulate ways to solve those issues with out-of-the-box ideas. So out-of-the-box is the key issue here. Um, attention to movement as propensity and Lee assist us to rethink the modernist split between subject and object because they address our attention to the active properties of a situation. The ice stupa system works with the many unfoldings in a situation. How things will percolate, cohere, and flow is part of the analysis and therefore part of the solution. Thinking, thinking about this, I think this attention to the constant movement of materiality opens the way for a shift in university scholarship, the shift of a relationship of mastery and control to working with and alongside materialities and their flows. Um, it is a scholarship that is aligned with the forces of nature. Thinking this way initiates a third movement of ideas. What kinds of universities, what kinds of politics, what kinds of knowledge might align anthropos, humanity, with planetary flows? What kind of environmental movement is possible with the Earth? So the third kind of movement that I wanted to, 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 to think with you about is in contemporary environmental politics, aligning with nature takes the form of struggles for, to claim for nature a legal personhood in order to correct the objectification of nature. For example, in Paris during COP21 in November 2015, the International Tribunal on, of the Rights of Nature was led by a distinguished environmental South African lawyer by the name of Cormac Cullinan, who's speaking here, um, and was attended by leading Southern environmentalists, including Vandana Shiva from India, Nemo Bassi from the Niger Delta in Nigeria, and Alberto Acosta, who drafted Ecuador's constitution, which includes the rights of nature and an entire chapter on soil in that, in that constitution. So this tribunal sought to build on the legal innovations of Ecuador, Bolivia, and Peru to establish earth rights in laws and constitutions. There is a whole conversation to be had about the contradictions accompanying those, the implementation of those constitutions. Ecuador has arrested many activists, environmental activists, in the last two years. But those laws, since those laws were drafted and constitutions, the United Nations has begun investing in an earth rights project. A river in New Zealand has, after almost a century of legal battles, achieved legal personhood, as have dolphins in India and a chimpanzee in New York. And in the past two months, two rivers and the glaciers that feed them were declared legal persons in the state of Uttarakhand in India. In the judgment, the judges in Uttarakhand wrote that rivers, streams, rivulets, lakes, air, meadows, dales, jungles, forests, wetlands, grasslands, springs, and waterfalls must be given corresponding rights and duties and liabilities of a living person in order to conserve and preserve them. So it's interesting to me that the, the current major intervention of decolonial thinkers and of activists, environmental activists in order to protect ecology and well-being has been to try to leverage the existing legal category of personhood in order to protect species and the living qualities of water sources and earth forms. Now, Elizabeth Pavanelli has argued in the book Geontologies that many of you would know that one of the contemporary forms of environmentalism in late liberalism is the figure of the animist. And indeed, she points out that the risk of an animist kind of environmentalism is that it's just brushed aside as non-science and therefore also non-sense. And I think this is an important issue to think with because the question is whether claiming legal personhood is the strongest and most sustainable form of environmental politics at the moment. Just as an aside, should you ever find yourself in an argument that, that uh, the claim for legal personhood is animist and therefore contrary to modernity, you may find it useful to point out that nobody ever asks CEOs to explain their belief in the personhood of their companies. Capitalists have been legal animists from the beginning. 
Um, these two cartoons come from various magazines. I don't know if you can read much of this. Um, this, this corporate person has a corporate charter, due process, perpetual life, legal personhood, uh, limited liability, um, and so on. There's another great cartoon I found here. Um, the corporation must, was very lonely, reads the father, because people thought it was different from them. <laughs> so, in other words, this, this, let's just think for a moment as anthropologists about this category of legal personhood. It's a, it's a little bit like an upgrade to business class, right? And, and the question is, is that the kind of upgrade that one needs? Does one need a moral upgrade to legal personhood? Or how could we adjust, temper, shift the kinds of, of, of ways that this, this argument is, to, is, is playing out? Now, the risk of opening this discussion in a situation like this, particularly in a keynote, is that words can be used by opponents of these legal interventions to continue the work of turning the earth to desert. So I speak carefully, knowing that battles in law can only be chosen with the available tools, precedents, and protocols. And so if legal personhood is the only available legal tool to prevent the desertification of the planet, then use it we should. But to give a glacier the same status in law as a corporation is only a small step. It's not a giant leap. If we were to ask the glacier how it wanted to be president, present in our legal systems, what would it say? And if, we were to ask, if it were to ask us how we wanted to be present in its relations with the world, what would we say? So legal personhood may remove the legal status of corporate mastery over the subject-object relations, but we need to be very cautious. To claim legal personhood is not the same as claiming kinship in the sense that a river is a brother or a mountain is a mother. After all, the, claim for legal, the, the struggle for legal personhood does not itself show a strong precedent of being effective. 200 years ago, after the same debate was held in white courts over whether slaves were legal persons or legal property, we still need Black Lives Matter. Attaining legal personhood is a strategy of survival in a system of ideas established in modernist thought and science and imposed by colonial, coloniality and its courts. But it requires equivocation because assimilation is violent. For every creature or earth form that wins an upgrade to personhood, there are those beings that are not upgraded. So, can there be a politics of the Anthropocene that dismantles non-being? Can we move from identifying the beings of the world, with a capital B, identifying the beings of the world, to being Earth, where we are in the Earth? I'm quoting the work of Edouard Clissant. Um, sorry, I'm just... Uh, I've missed a slide here. This, there's a, a couple of posters. This is from the, the COP21 in Paris meeting. Um, but at the same time, at the bottom one, Julia Roberts' Mother Nature, which is a particular um, version of, um, of this argument that's put, been put together by, by our Conservation International, one of the big environmental NGOs. So in translation, these kind of terms shake down in ways that we don't always want. And I think it's really important to think about translation. Um, for Eduardo Glissant, um, his Poetics of Relation is an extraordinary work. Glissant was a contemporary of Cézé, also from the, the Caribbean, the Antilles. And in his own struggles with being and non-being, wrote this extraordinary book called Poetics of Relation. And for Glissant, it's, an extra, it's one of the most exciting books I've, if I've ever, ever read, because he asks us, in very personal ways, to think about relation as itself a risk when we start to move towards thinking of ourselves in relation, it is to risk being of the world, and it is to risk um, not, no longer ascendancy and evolution, the ascendancy and supremacy that comes from the evolutionary pyramid, which challenges the being of all others. Um, one line of his that I thought was particularly re relevant to this struggle over the translation of personhood is this. If one is in too much of a hurry to join the concert, he wrote, there is a risk of mistaking as autonomous participation, something that is only some disguise left over 
of former participations. So what languages are there for participations in political and legal life other than the juridical fiction of legal personhood? How do we translate kinship and being in the earth? How do we translate relationality without betraying and without occulting? And in this question, I really want to acknowledge the work of Mario Blazer, who I, have, I assume is here, um, and Marisol de la Cadena, um, if they've been exploring these issues. Now, the Anthropocene, or as some prefer to call it, Capitalocene, arises from the forms of relation that generated colonialism, this division of the world into subjects and objects. Post-colonial writers remind us that the master's house will never be taken down with the master's tools. The ideas that have created the Anthropocene or the Capitalocene are not, not going to be able to unmake it. So what interventions are there that are capable of decolonizing this business class personhood that the legal battle to, for personhood seems to slip into in, way, in moments where, where it takes on a life of its own. And that leads me to a question of translating knowledge, which is the last of the, the different kinds of movement I want to think with you about. And the question that, that, that exercises me in this case is, how do we decolonize the Anthropocene, the Capitalocene, with the available tools of expertise that we have? Or to rephrase that, if we put, were to imagine ourselves 50 years ahead, telling the story of now, <coughs> what story would we tell of the sciences that the decolonials needed in order to succeed in decolonizing this Anthropocene that we find ourselves in? So, this question of translation, and I wanted to draw your attention to the fact that translation itself, actually historically as a word, comes from, from movement. In Middle English, uh, translation was not necessarily a matter of translating language. To be translated was to move. When you moved from one duchy or one dukedom to another in feudal times, you were translated. In other words, all your relations with the wider world changed. Our work as researchers and scholars and the trainers of experts is to allow ourselves to be translated from the space of property and territory to a place in which we are asking of glaciers and streams, dolphins and deserts, the kind of questions in which the answers do not land them in our checkboxes of either beings or non-beings. Decolonizing oneself and one's expertise in the Anthropocene requires learning to live in relation with rock, water, air, life. Reclaiming that commons sense, to borrow from Isabel Stengers, the sense of earth that beings living and non-living share. There are many languages and heritage of, th of thought that have cultivated the arts of living in partnership with creatures and critters and with the responsiveness that inheres in living with the movements of water and soil and even continents. Hence, the critical importance of decolonizing thought, resisting the categories and stasis that is the dominant intellectual heritage of our university, requires us to pay attention to a whole range of different kinds of, way of movement. So, just to recap over those, whether our scholarship is circumlocuting the occultations of neoliberalism or attending to flow and coherence, or thinking about how to translate legal personhood. It is scholarship itself that is being moved, that is being translated. And it is in translating our being as experts into being as relation. These are the movements that can change us, who are here as inheritors of the university. Thanks. Uh, 
Hello? All right. So, maybe you answered everything with your talk. But there is one question. Um, uh, what about the possibility of um, movement being violent and the violence of movement? that also being a site for colonization and perpetuating, uh, yeah. Do you want to say a little bit more about, oh. Okay. Okay. Um, uh, do you want to say a little bit more about what, where your thoughts are going? Well, I'm thinking about it um, in terms of sometimes movements can, the bo even the bodily, bodily movements can perpetuate certain um, things that can be hurtful. Um, and so just thinking about that on a larger scale, um, the way things uh, moving in and out of space even can become a kind of violence. Um, the, the rhythm of how you move in and out of space can become a kind of violence. I, I don't know, just flipping. Yeah, yeah, just, and, yeah, and maybe that's not also always bad, but th there's different ways of thinking about it beyond just something that could be helpful or, yeah. or good. Yeah, no, great idea, great suggestion. Thank you. Yeah. Um, you said that the tools that made the master's house cannot take it apart, but maybe it could make the house a little bit more inclusive and tolerant of, um, you know, glaciers and dolphins and all this. And isn't that, because the house is already existing, right, we're, we're pushing the metaphor, aren't we, quite far, but um, I mean it's still preferable to the situation at present whereby we're just destroying, uh, that the master's house is basically excluding everything that sustains life. So in terms of being realistic, um, shouldn't the movement be towards broadening the master's house? Like, you know, the, the whole strategy of using what legal tools we have, etc., and uh, forms of knowledge that have traction already yep. um, to achieve tangible uh, improvements. Do you just dismiss that strategy entirely? Yeah. I hope it would come across that I'm not dismissing that strategy entirely, but thinking of the ways in which it, in turn, takes on a life of its own in different kinds of discourses and holding, holding that to account to what we want it to be held account to so that one doesn't um, have a situation where Julia Roberts becomes Mother Earth in the name of Conservation International, um, which I find an obscenity, frankly. <laughs> um, but, um, um, but also I think it's important, I, th I think of that master's house meta saying as, in fact, not so much about the structure, but about the relation. As long as it's the master's house, the available tools will only ever be the tools that perpetuate mastery. Um, and I think that, that um, if I can go back to um, that image, you know, the, where we have Darwin's tree of evolution with man at the top, um, that for me is the, is the, is the pinnacle of, a, of, a, of an approach of mastery, human mastery over, over the whole of life and the world. The question is to move to think, so this, this image here, which is a, a, a graphic many of you might know from, from that attempts to show deep time. Um, the, pinnacle, the pinnacle of the tree on the one hand is you're already at the top, you're always the master. A different way of, of understanding um, one's relationality, one's history um, in, in different conceptual terms with the, the flow of time, the flow of, of, of all things, um, I think puts us in a more modest relation and perhaps changes the relation of mastery so that it isn't the master's house, but it's a, a, a space that is fundamentally different in terms of the relations that, that, that give it meaning. That's where I'm going with that. But it's, it's, a, it's, a, 
I think it's such an important issue to think about. Um, uh, you know, I think uh, there's a lot of work in political ontology that takes us into the, this legal personhood, and it's wonderful, excellent work. And yet, as we all know, when things work, you know, find their way into the capitalist world, um, they, they, they take on um, forms that were never intended. Um, so the, 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 the immense challenge there is, is, is to, to understand that ontology itself can be haunted. And I love that phrase, the hauntology, which comes from Derrida. Um, the, the hauntologies that are with us, where the ontologies that take form, and however they take form, remain haunted by the colonial mastery, which is embedded in scientific mastery and scientific transcendence because of this assumption that our knowledge is law. Um, and that, I think, is where Ser is so incredibly useful in helping us to understand the, the slippage from, from geometrical law as a way of knowing, and, and the whole history of, of the ways in which this idea of geometrical law filters down through the sciences and where scientific knowing becomes law in, in spheres that it never should be, um, where we need to retain that, that um, careful, passionate um, thinking through of certainty and doubt that comes with the best form of science and not confuse it with the discovery channel version of fundamentalist science, which is total truth and, and an extension of the colonial project, if I may say. Mm. Well, thank you so much. Well, you gave the examples of uh, India that they have given a status of. I'm sorry, I'm. I'm, I'm well, uh, you gave this example of India that they yes. have given the uh, living standard to the rivers, lakes, yes. and rivers. But uh, what, what, is, what can we do uh, to save the indigenous people in this economic growth, uh, indigenous cultures? Because I belong to India. There are quite a number of indigenous cultures and uh, people living there. But to cope up with the economic growth, they have to move towards yeah. the uh, development. So when, when they go for the development, there's the loss of the culture and the heritage. So what actually we, we do uh, to preserve both the things? Mm. No. I think that um, I'm very hesitant to get into the language of, of saving because I think the white man's burden creates the language of saving. But I do think that the, that the kinds of discussions that universities need to be having with people who are in trouble are very different to the ones that we have at the moment, which are characterized by experts who speak for and about. Um, Trin Minh Ha, Vietnamese anthropologist, uh, once said something so beautiful, she said, in my anthropology, I do not speak about, I speak nearby. And I think these kinds of interactions, where, which are just a beginning of, of, a, of a much more thoughtful engagement um, between universities to get away from this idea that we are the experts about people, um, and to draw people in to, to think about the kinds of, of situations, and to fight, you know, um, to, you know, to fight these legal battles imperfect as the tools are, um, but to always know that, that, they, that one is working with a juridical fiction um, so that we don't allow ex exquisite theories of relation to be upgrades to business class, to put it that way. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I think, Romola, you want to have the last word, and then you can help us move into the drumming. Oops. Oh, okay, well, then uh, I, I shall perhaps uh, uh, comment. So I shall tie it uh, in then with the, um, the person that so many people have honored today, Grandfather William Commander. Um, I'm South African, so thank you for a marvelous, marvelous presentation. It's really been so inspirational. But my friend and I were talking all our drive up to Manawaki to bring Evelyn down about Grandfather Commander's uh, thoughts about nature. And I noticed you, you, you presented something about COP21, uh, or I think it was. Yes. Uh, but uh, I was remembering that at the pre-Rio conference in Paris in the early 90s, Grandfather Commander did three days of pipe ceremony over there to create a sense of relationship a relationship with Mother Earth. Mm -hmm. And then in that, in that process, he, um, uh, I suppose, was positioning, rather than his 
master's house, actually the mistress's, his mother earth. And, and, and it's really interesting that it was Bolivia that talked about the rights of Mother Earth and, and push forward this uh, language from that indigenous perspective. So I would kind of like to say the way uh, Grandfather Commander uh, tried to teach people was to occupy the space. Uh, so he didn't so much ask permission as he wanted to share because he felt that relationship thing was so so huge uh, uh, in his perspective. And I like to say that it was after he wrote our book, uh, Learning from a Kindergarten Dropout, that the University of Ottawa here presented him with his honorary doctorate degree and also created a hall in his name. So uh, with that, I would like to say thank you re really to, 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 to Scott and the conference organizing team for including and ensuring that indigenous and Algonquin people are so much a part of the spirit of this effort. Thank you for the, the, the drummers for bringing that, that prayer, that heartbeat of Mother Earth. Thank you, Evelyn, for leaving your worries about the floods, the water that is actually seeping into your home and the lake. And it's not something that you haven't experienced before because in 1974, Grandfather Commander lost his teaching lodge, which flowed down uh, the waters. So the, the relationship with Mother Earth and all these kinds of things, yeah, you're right. We so much need a new shift in perspective. And thank you then. Julie, I'll pass it over to you. Miigwech. Thank you. thank you so much. Hi. Well, thank you very much, Leslie. That was a wonderful talk that I'm sure will continue throughout the week as we will continue to speak with you throughout the week as well. And I think you have the final word. Huh? Look, um, thank you so much for hanging in there. I think it's, um, it's, 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 uh, it's, it's been a long session, but thank you. Hmm. Miigwech, thank you. Um, it was a great morning. Uh, the grandfather, drum spirit, came here and is here, and it was very strong this morning when we smoked our pipe outside. And it's very real. Like I said, this drum here, it comes from the Thunderbirds, and everything you see here, it's made from the bush, the moose hide, the cedar tree, which is the the um, hoop of the drum and the black ash tree here that holds up the, the Thunderbird spirit. This is what it is, the white-headed Thunderbird. His two black wings and his tail here in the south. And when they tried to take our drums and burn them, you cannot kill a spirit. So... That's our word, that our, like I said, they entrenched our rights only as existing in the Constitution, but we are not existing. We are real, and the spirits here are real. Our body and our heart is real. The existing is not here in our minds to be played with by the governments for our ex real government, Anishinaabe win our life. So with that, I'm going to say thank you again to everyone that spoke, and this is who we are. The name of our drum is called the Kichisipirini, which means we are the people of the Ottawa River, and our hereditary chief in history was Tezewit. And he was the chief of all of the Algonquin people in Quebec and Ontario here, which all the rivers flow in that I talked about, like the Madawaska, the Wescarini, and the ones that flow in from Gatineau. There's like nine or ten rivers in there. So that's where our people live. And my ancestors come from over by Montreal, they call that. Lake Two Mountains. And our people travel up to this river here 
we were the descendants of the Kichisipirini. And this is the name of our drum, the Kichisipirini. The people of the Ottawa River, and we like to thank you. And the grandfather's spirit was so happy to be here and came in strong. And we're going to sing a special song that we always sing to send the grandfather's spirit, Thunderbird, back to the heavens. And that's what this song represents. And at the end of the song, you will hear the thunder. You will hear the lightning as we finish the song. Thanks. Miigwech.